Our next speaker is an assistant professor at the Kennedy School who served as special assistant to the president for energy and environment in 2009 to 2010, during which he coordinated the Obama administration's economic analysis of the BP oil spill. He also participated in the Copenhagen and Cancun UN-sponsored climate change negotiations, serving as the lead White House official at the talks in Cancun, which I hear is just a terrible, terrible vacation destination. Uh, sand gets in your shoes, you know, the temperature only barely hovers around perfect, and the water's too clear for skinny dipping. With his talk titled, Tapping the Power of Markets to Protect the Environment, please welcome to the stage Professor Joseph Aldi. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the Office of Sustainability for organizing this and for you for joining us here tonight. I'd like to talk to you about the power of markets, how we can use markets effectively to better our environment. Markets are very powerful institutions. They allow entrepreneurs to actually seek out new opportunities to profit by bringing new products to market. They provide consumers the means to actually meet their basic needs and to meet their sometimes not all that basic wants. They allow innovators to be able to bring their ideas from inspiration to new products. Markets are also very, very fast. We've seen this in a number of contexts. Most recently, the fact that in just a matter of days, before they can even show up on store shelves, Apple's already sold several million iPhones. Markets can actually do an incredible amount of good, but sometimes we've seen them do incredible amounts of bad. If you look at the market reforms in China over the last 35 years, they've contributed to phenomenal economic growth and lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. In contrast, we know all too well here in the United States what happens when markets start to unravel, when we look at what happened with the financial crisis, leading to the Great Recession, destroying trillions of dollars of wealth, and leaving millions of Americans out of work. So with this context, when we think about the power of markets, how might we actually apply some of the lessons from these markets, how we might harness the power of markets to improve our environment? Let me first turn to an example to look at the power of markets in the United States in the power market. In 2008, we used coal to generate about half the electricity in America. About one-fifth of our electricity that year was generated by natural gas. This year, in April, we used just as much natural gas as we did coal to produce electricity in America. And we're on track this year to use about 36% of our power from coal and about 31% from natural gas. So in just five years, we've gone from a market share of about 30 percentage points to just five. Now, that's not the result of any kind of government mandates. It's not like there's some collusion now among utilities to try to take advantage of natural gas and to push out coal. It's reflecting the fundamentals of this market, where the price of coal has continued to rise slowly over the last five years, while the price of gas has come down dramatically. Today, gas costs 80% less than it did in 2008. This reflects, in large part, the dramatic increase in domestic supply, primarily from shale gas that has driven down these price declines. What impact has this actually had on the environment? Well, we've seen our CO2 emissions go down. We're using less coal to generate a fraction of our electricity in America than at any time since at least the 1940s. In 2010, our CO2 emissions in the power sector were at least 3% lower as a result of this fuel switching. And importantly, when we think about the contribution of the power sector to other environmental problems, conventional air pollutants that cause respiratory problems, premature mortality, we're even much better off by the fact that natural gas is much cleaner than coal. Now, let's take an example of the power of markets when we look in the developing world. Indonesia has historically subsidized fossil fuels. In particular, they have intervened in the market to suppress the price of gasoline, diesel, and kerosene, well below what a competitive market would yield. So much so that in recent years, Indonesia has spent one out of every five dollars in their national budget just to subsidize petroleum products. Now, Indonesia is not alone. Globally, we're spending something on the order 
of a half trillion or more dollars to subsidize fossil fuels on an annual basis. Now, in 2005, Indonesia realized it wasn't sustainable to continue to keep prices so low, and so they implemented some reforms. What you found is that while petroleum consumption was growing on about a 5% annual basis before the reforms, and the first year after the reforms, oil consumption fell 8%. Now, you might think, wow, if the price of gasoline goes up, and in fact, in Indonesia, it doubled. If the price of diesel goes up, it also doubled. That must be awful for their economy. Everything we read about here is that if the price of gasoline goes up at all, it'll be awful for the U.S. economy. Indonesia, in the first year after the reform, experienced 5% economic growth, which is actually faster than the annual rate of growth they had in the years leading up to the reforms. And their emissions of CO2, which had been growing 7% annually from the combustion of fossil fuels, only grew 1% in that first year after the reforms because of the significant changeover to, uh, uh, significant changeover to using less fuel as a result of these reforms. So what are the implications then when we look at these sort of two examples and we think more broadly about the power of markets? What are the implications then for how we think about environmental policy? First, what's important to draw from both these examples is that businesses and families respond to a change in energy prices. When you actually have a change in two different fuels a power sector can use, utilities aren't dumb, they're going to use the lower cost fuel. They'll take advantage of that cost uh, differential to be able to produce power at a lower price. If you see the price of fuel go up, you'll become more efficient. You'll economize on your use of that fuel so that you can actually reduce the burden that you face from that higher cost. Second, it's important, though, to recognize that markets don't always work perfectly. They don't solve every single problem. They do suffer what we call failures. You know, I can't go to the corner drugstore and buy a tube of smog-free summer days. I can't buy a box that has in it at least a little bit of a stable global climate, at least just for me. You know, there's no way that actually anyone produces this in the market. The technologies don't exist, even if they did. Even if I thought, wait, I could buy my own smog-free summer days if I go to the drugstore, the question is, would I really do it? If I thought someone else might benefit from that, I was like, well, wait, if, if this other guy is going to actually go buy smog-free summer days, I can enjoy the benefits of that without actually having to make that purchase. And so I'm going to free ride on the efforts of others. And when enough people in the markets think that way, we tend not to provide enough of these public goods, like air quality or a stable climate. That right there is a cause then for us to think about what role the government can play to help correct this market failure. It's important to recognize that when we're trying to think about the design of a government intervention, that we should learn the lessons about what the most effective way we can intervene can be and how we can draw from the experience of markets to design that thoughtful policy. If we know people change their behavior in response to a change in prices, maybe that's how we actually ought to use the markets to our benefit for the environment. The important thing when we think about this, especially as we turn to the context of climate change, an incredibly pressing problem, one in which we've not taken adequate effort here in the United States to confront, if we're to actually recognize that the emissions of greenhouse gases impose costs on society, the most thoughtful way to harness the market is to make businesses recognize those costs in their everyday activities. Firms actually incur costs when they hire a worker to come to their factory, when they buy material inputs like steel in their manufacturing. Well, they ought to think that actually emitting greenhouse gases, carbon pollution, is a cost of doing business too. And just like they have the incentive to be just as efficient as possible in how they use a worker and the production of their goods, that they are as efficient as possible to use that steel as an input in their manufacturing, they'll recognize they need to be efficient about their carbon pollution. They ought to seek out ways and seek out the lowest cost ways, because it's in their interest, to reduce their carbon pollution. So then that suggests then when we think about policy, we need to do what economists describe as pricing carbon. You put a price on carbon, you make it a cost of doing business. You know, 
even if they're not tree huggers in all these businesses around the country, it's now in their, they now have that incentive, it's in their interest to seek out and exploit the lowest cost ways to reduce carbon pollution. Now, you know, I can stand here and say, let's just put a price on carbon. I can describe a variety of policies uh, that one could pursue. You could implement a carbon tax. You could implement cap and trade. You could implement a so-called clean energy standard. And I recognize, of course, I used to work in Washington, that the political environment may not be so warm to these ideas. It's easy to demonize a carbon tax, we just call it a tax. Uh, it's easy to de demonize cap and trade because we change the name to cap and tax. Clean energy standard, they'd probably like to call it clean energy tax, but they would just describe it as some big government meddling in the economy. The thing is, when the economy isn't working efficiently, when the markets don't work to deliver what we need, you need government intervention to make us as a society better off to deliver what we as individuals in society want, but the markets aren't delivering. So when someone says, hey, uh, politically, these ideas are crazy, I say, well, no, let's actually have a serious debate about this. Let's not just sort of have a debate on like brief rhetoric. If it's a tax, it must be evil, but actually, what are the merits of this? And let's actually look at the successful record we have historically in harnessing the market to protect the environment. We used a market-based approach to phase out lead from gasoline in the United States in the 1980s. We used a market-based approach to tackle acid rain in the 1990s. We used a market-based approach to phase out the ozone-depleting substances that were destroying the stratosph stratospheric ozone layer. Thousands of communities around the country use market-based approaches to reduce the generation of solid waste and encourage recycling. In the Northeast states, it's modest, but we're pricing carbon in the power sector. California is pricing carbon. British Columbia to the north is pricing carbon. Alberta, where all the oil sands production comes from. You could think of it as the Texas of Canada if you want, <laughs> pricing carbon. We look across the Atlantic, Europe is pricing carbon. Australia is pricing carbon. New Zealand is pricing carbon. China is launching pilot programs in a number of provinces to price carbon. So this was originally an American innovation, this idea that we harness markets to protect the environment. And you know what? It's been successful, and the rest of the world knows it, and they're going for it. And so the challenge now for us here in the United States is to engage our political process to realize that kind of outcome as well. If we can harness the power of markets, we can really fundamentally change the incentives for how we produce energy, how we consume energy, and in doing so, we can leave a better planet for our children and grandchildren. Thank you.